Holográfia. A 120 éve született és 50 éve Nobel-díjat kapó Gábor Dénes máig zseniális találmánya, amivel létre lehet hozni a tárgyak valósági háromdimenziós képét. De mégis hogyan lehetséges mindez? Képzeljük el, hogy a fénysugár megtörik egy bizonyos tárgyon, mondjuk ezen az almán. Ezért látjuk az almát nappal, és ezért nem látjuk fény nélkül sötétben. A feladat az, hogy ezt az alma formán megtört fénysugarat kellene visszaállítani akkor is, amikor az alma már nincs ott. Mesterségesen hozzunk létre egy másik fénysugarat, és keverjük össze ezt a kettőt. Ezek a fények egymással mintázatokat hoznak létre, nekünk pedig az a feladatunk, hogy ezeket a mintázatokat rögzítsük. Így, ha az eredeti fénysugarat eltüntetjük, de a másik fénysugár egyezményesen jelen van mindenhol a világon, és ez megvilágítja a rögzített mintázatot, akkor a rendszer automatikusan kidobja az eredeti fénysugarat, és ott fogjuk látni az almát, ahol már nincsen. Na, így hangzik egy Nobel-díjat érő találmány. Indeed, today's event is revolving around holography and its inventor Gábor Dénes, known internationally as Dennis Gábor. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, dear viewers. Welcome at the Let's Invent the Future Together online event held on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Dennis Gábor's Nobel Prize he won for inventing holography. Amisha Musa, Science and Technology Counselor at the Embassy of Hungary in Seoul, the moderator of this event. Kicking off the program, let's listen to the official greetings from His Excellency Ambassador Dr. Moses Choma, Embassy of Hungary in Seoul, and Mr. Istvan Medvid, Director of Liszt Hungarian Cultural Institute in Seoul. Uri moli toročenju Hongari, va hampando je sanktaga, a ču pisit pisit ham neda. Hongari katun kion go edo, oton tuk pio han čiha čavoni obsim neda. Tank so ge so, kirumi o lao džijanko, gasuga o lao džijan sim neda. Ili ok čavon pak je obsim neda. Iron šiguro, Hongari katun kion go enun, kio juk. Mit koa hak kisuri, a ču čung jo ham neda. Hulion kan Hongari hak ča ga borde naši, Nobel sangul paro ošim jon džone pada sum neda. I čung jo han kinjom heng sarul, čung bi han kvali ča bundulke, čin šim uro kam saturi go, čung ši gan ponešigi param neda. Kam sam neda. Jorobut anjaj šim nika, ču han list hongari munha vončan ištvan medvič im neda. Onil katten tuk kipen heng saje, jorobun gva hamke hage teo ki puge, Sengak Hamneda. Hongari we videhan Uli Hakcha, Hong Hakcha, Palmion Kain, Gabor Denesten, Chon Kubek Sashi Pchinyone, Holographiril, Palmion Esimida. Chong Haki Oshi Pion Chonin, Chon Kubek Chishi Pilnion, I Palmionro, Gabor Denesten, Nobel Uli Haksanuel, Susan Esimida. I videhan Palmion Kawa, Kri Kajan Chumyohan, Opchoko. Kirigi vihe chumbihan i kinyom hengsae, chamka he chushin modun bundulke chim shimro kamsa terimnida. Ibon hengsanen kasan hyonshi reso chin heng tejiman, chuhan list hongari munhwa wohan esonen onjeden chikchop pangmun ashaduk terimnida. Hongari kukka, yoksa, palmyongkawa, palmyongpum tenge tehe kwanshim itsushin bundule ramyon choi munhwa wohan eso Thank you, Ambassador and Director, for your kind words. An excerpt from a recent press release issued by the Korea Ministry of Science and ICT on the occasion of Korea-Hungary Scientific and Technological Cooperation says, quote, Hungary is a basic science powerhouse that has produced 12 Nobel laureates in the field of science and technology. Hungarian researchers are credited with many groundbreaking research findings that brought significant changes to the humanity." Unquote. Of these 12 Nobel Prizes, five were awarded in chemistry, while three each in physics and medicine. Dear viewers, please turn your attention now to Mr. Andrei Such, cultural attaché at the Liszt Institute in Seoul, who will shed light on some of the reasons behind these successes.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our online event. In a short presentation, I would like to introduce why Hungarian scientists play a significant role in natural sciences worldwide and why this national achievement is called the Hungarian phenomenon. The main reason why Hungarian achievements have aroused public interest is because Hungary has 13 plus one Nobel awarded scientists. The plus one is Elie Wiesel's Nobel Peace Prize. And as a small nation with less than 10 million people, it's quite a huge accomplishment. The list on the slide illustrates some of the brilliant and creative people who were born and educated in Hungary. This list includes many Nobel, Abel and Wolf Prize winners. Uh, you may know that Abel and Wolf Prizes are recognitions for mathematicians since Nobel Prize doesn't exist in math. Furthermore, many of them are originators of several important ideas and called the fathers of something. For example, Janos Neumann is the father of computers and game theory. Todor Karman is the father of modern aerodynamics and supersonic flight. Dinesh Gabor is the father of holography. Edda Teller is the father of the hydrogen bomb. And Leo Szilard is the father of the chain reaction. This shows that uh, their minds were not only great, but they were also extremely creative. The phrase Hungarian phenomenon has been in use since the 1950s, and you can find several international publications about the Hungarian successes. For example, for this presentation, among others, I used Ling Siu Hing's publication from the Hong Kong Institute of Education. The early 20th century saw the emergence of many bright scientists and mathematicians in Budapest. That few decades proved to be an exceptional fertile ground for scientific talents, when economic development provided the right background for scientific advances. As Peter Lux, the Wolf and Abel Prize mathematician once said, he was Hungarian as well, you don't have to be Hungarian to be a mathematician, but it helps. And I would like to explain shortly what the reasons are behind this. When they were asked, almost all scientists emphasized that secondary education and the Hungarian cultural background played a huge role in becoming successful. The first and second factors of the success were the so-called Utvish contest and the secondary school mathematical journal, which is also called Kömang in Hungarian. The competitiveness has been the stimulation of mathematics. It has been playing a role in motivating mathematical culture in the Hungarian society. Furthermore, it can also provide a channel to search for talents. The annual mathematical contests and the secondary school mathematical journal both started in 1894, and they have been open to Hungarian high school students since. They played a remarkable role in the development of mathematics and physics. Um, the names of the winners include many famous Hungarian Nobel of Art scientists in their early years. The contest always challenges the creativity of their students rather than their knowledge. The importance of this competition is shown by the fact that in the 1950s, uh, two scientists from Hungary, George Puy and Gabor Segu, introduced similar competitions in California. The Mathematical Journal is the second oldest mathematical monthly for school children in the world. The first one was published in France in 1875. And it aims at posing problems and providing additional teaching materials for secondary schools. Several famous scientists remembered waiting eagerly for the arrival of the monthly issue. When one of the most famous, most famous Hungarian mathematicians, Paul Erdős, was asked if he was affected by the Kemal, he said, yes, of course, you could actually learn solve problems there, and many of the good mathematicians realized very early that they had competence. So finding and cultivating creativity are the first key factors that were boosted by these social tools. The third factor is the good high school education. More or less all the famous Hungarian scientists, even the recently globally celebrated potential Nobel Prize winner Katalin Koriko, thanks to whom the Pfizer vaccine was created. So most of them emphasize the role of their high school teachers. The physical Nobel award, Jano Wigner, even kept his high school professor Laszlo Ratz photograph uh, on his office wall. Wigner remembered that his school was at that time perhaps the best high school of Hungary and probably also one of the best ones in the world. The father of photography, Danish Gabor, 
also expressed the huge role of the Hungarian schools in his professional career. But other Nobel winners also said that good and dedicated teaching is one of the reasons behind their success because many teachers made great efforts to deepen their interest in natural sciences. We need to emphasize Laszlo Rastro, who was Neumann and Wigner's teacher at the Lutheran High School in Budapest. He and many other of his colleagues could recognize their talented students and knew how to inspire them. They recognized the talents, took them under their wings, and arranged free private lessons in order to send them to universities. And the fourth factor is the historical background. Before the First World War, Hungary had the broad middle class, which considered the education of their children a priority. Even after the First World War, when Hungary lost 66% of its territory, education, was still, education still remained a key priority for the country. In the 1920s, Kuno Klebesberg was the Minister of the Education and Culture, and un under his ministership, the country spent 10 to 12% of its GDP each year to boost culture and education. Klebesberg established several universities, scientific institutions, more than 5,000 public schools all around the country, and even the first bigger Hungarian cultural institutes were established under his ministership in Vienna, Berlin, Rome, and Paris in order to have the studies of Hungarian students in those countries. At that time, all teachers in the public ed education had to report directly to the ministry if they found a young talent in order to help them to get into, into higher education. In the 1920s, Hungarian politics recognized that education has a key role in becoming successful as a modern nation. Maybe this attitude was one of the reasons why every president of the United States worked together with Hungarian scientific advisors from the Second World War even until the 1990s. And finally, it is important to explain why five out of the 13 Nobel laureates were awarded in the field of chemistry. Firstly, obviously for all parents, uh, it was a priority to provide good education for their children for better chances for a suitable job. And in the early 20th century, the booming chemical industry was the most promising sector in Hungary. This was the very reason why even Janos Neumann, the greatest mathematician, graduated in chemistry. Secondly, since the general scientific interest at that time was focused on atoms, it was the most fashionable field of science at that time, and back then, that scientific field was the closest to chemistry. So, by learning chemistry, students also acquire practical knowledge, which is why Hungarian Nobel Prize winning scientists reached not only theoretical, theoretical discoveries, but also boosted many engineering inventions, such as the hologram or the first computer. So to sum up, the key factors behind the Hungarian phenomenon are the following. Finding creativity, highlighting talents, dedicated teachers, and investment into the education. And actually, there is one more factor, and uh, this is my favorite. This argument comes from Edda Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb. He said once the following, the Hungarian language is so difficult that on its own, it is a logic developer. Learning it means that you can be an expert in solving mathematical, physical, and logical questions. So with this, I reached to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much uh, for your attention and thank you very much for being with us today. A jövőt az föl kell találni, ezt nem lehet megjósolni, azt tényleg föl kell találni. 120 esztendeje, 1900. június 5-én született Gábor Dénes Nobel-díjas fizikus, a holográfia feltalálója, aki makacsul hitt a tudomány erejében. Mindössze 10 éves volt, amikor első szabadalmát benyújtotta, amelyet még 62 követett. Érdeklődésének páratlan értékű lenyomata a Magyar Tudományos Akadémián őrzött gyermekkori füzete, amelyet 8 évesen kezdett el rajzolni. A világ technikai csodáira figyelő és azokra nyitott kisfiú rajzai ezek, repülőkkel, gőzhajókkal, motorokkal, gépekkel és az azokat használó emberekkel. 
hogy hogyan lesz valakiből nobel díjas tudós. Nos, leginkább úgy, hogy mindig mindent kicsit másképp lát. Mindig keresi az újat. Állandóan kérdéseket fogalmaz meg, és nem elégszik meg a már meglévő válaszokkal. Ez az állandó kíváncsiság hajtotta Gábor Dénest is. Így lett a Magyar Királyi József Nádor Műszaki és Gazdaság Tudományi Egyetem hallgatójából 1920-ra a Berlini Humboldt Egyetem hallgatója, ahol az előadások mellett többek között Albert Einstein szemináriumának állandó résztvevője volt. Mind a mai napig a fülemben van a hangja, senki úgy nem élvezte a tudományt, mint Einstein. Valósággal elolvadt a szájában a tudomány, és ott van Einstein lavas rögnye, 8 Nobel-díjas ült a, a, fizika, a fizikális és kolotium első padján. Ezek voltak az igazi tanárai. Mérnöki diplomával a kezében első munkahelyén a nagyfeszültségű villamos távvezetékekben létrejövő tranziens jelenségek vizsgálatával foglalkozott. Doktori értekezést írt a katót sugárcsőről. A 30-as években dolgozott a Siemens, az Egyesült Izzó, majd a British Thomson Houston Társaság kísérleti laboratóriumában. Érdeklődése az elektron és az ion fizikától, az elektromikroszkópián át elvezetett az optikához és az információ elmélethez. Mindeközben, mint egy mellékesen, 1946 és 1951 között megszületett a holográfia elmélete. Gábor Dénes 1949-től a londoni Imperial College-ban oktatott elektronikát. 1958-ban az alkalmazott elektronfizika professzorává nevezték ki. Alkotott holográfiai mikroszkópot, univerzális analóg számítógépet, egy új típusú termionikus átalakítót és olyan színes, lapos képcsövet konstruált, amelyben a többszörösen megtört elektronsugár útjának zömét a képernyővel párhuzamosságban teszi meg. A holográfia feltalálásáért és lehetőségeinek kiaknázásáért 1971-ben fizikai Nobel-díjat kapott. Kiemelkedő szakmai sikerei csúcspontján Gábor Dénes figyelme az emberiség egészét érintő világméretű problémák megoldása felé fordult. Ezt jelzik művei, a jövő feltalálása, a tudományos műszak és társadalmi újítások, az érett társadalom, valamint az a munka, amelyet a római klub tagjaként vállalt. Gábor Dénes szellemi örökségét legaktívabban talán a Novofer alapítvány ápolja. Az alapítvány 1989-ben alapította az azóta minden évben átadott hazai és nemzetközi Gábor Dénes díjat. Az elmúlt bő 20 esztendőben a hazai tudományos élet 230 kiemelkedő alakja részesült a kitüntetésben. A díj a civil szféra egyik legnevesebb műszaki alkotói elismerése a Magyarországon. A díjazottak pedig mind-mind elsők a saját szakterületükön, ahogyan a névadó Gábor Dénes is kiváló érzékkel és múlhatatlan kíváncsisággal kereste a fennálló problémák megoldását. Gábor Dénes a nobel díját adó ünnepségen tartott beszédében a holográfia további felhasználásának lehetőségeire hívja fel a figyelmet. Alig 70 évvel a holográfia elvének kidolgozása után már a mesterséges intelligencia, a gépi tanulás és a fejlett vizuális érzékelő technológia mind-mind használja a holográfia elvét. Mi pedig méltán lehetünk büszkék arra, hogy az eredeti gondolat megszületése Gábor Dénesnek köszönhető. After the short clip about Dennis Gabor, we welcome our first presenter in the scientific part of the event, Professor Byung Hu Lee, who is known as the best foreign expert in holography. He is a fellow at several international societies, including Society for Optics and Photonics, Optical Society of America, Society for Information Display, and IEEE. Since 2005, he has been a professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Seoul National University. He is currently the Dean, College of Engineering at SNU. At present, he is the President of the Coral Information Display Society and Director at the International Society for Optics and Photonics. Professor Lee, the virtual floor is yours.
Hello, I am Byung Ho Lee with Seoul National University in Korea. It is my great pleasure and honor to give a talk today. The title of my presentation is Holography in AR-VR Display. This is the outline of my presentation. After a short introduction of holography and AR and VR, I'll talk about the typical AR-VR devices and issues, and then I'll explain how can holography participate in AR-VR display. And then I'll talk about some recent researches in holographic display, and then I'll conclude my talk. This is a typical example of holography. Holography is a technique that enables wavefronts to be recorded and later reconstructed. Holography is best known as a method of generating three-dimensional images, but originally it means to record and regenerate wavefronts as they are. So we can observe 3D images like this. And the concept of holography was uh, first uh, proposed by Dennis Garber in 1948, uh, which was before the invention of lasers. Actually, for generating good holography, we need laser as light source, as I will explain later. But the laser uh, appeared in the world in 1960. So this was long ago before the invention or appearance of the lasers. So after the invention of the laser, uh, people became to be interested in the concept of the holography. So uh, Dennis Gabo received the Nobel Prize for this work in 1971. So this year, 2021, uh, is the 50th anniversary of the, the Nobel uh, Prize given to the concept of the holography. This is the basic idea of holography. Here is the storing medium such as uh, film. Generally speaking, the optical wave that is diffracted or reflected by an object has this kind of uh, wavefront. It means that uh, on this plane, if this light wave is coming in, actually at uh, every point, the light intensity is the accumulation of uh, several wavefronts in its uh, intensity. So generally speaking, the recording medium, every recording medium, such as films, CCD cameras, image sensors, and even human eyes uh, can record only the intensity, uh, not phase. Phase means the delay of wavefront. So to regenerate this kind of original wavefront, actually at every point, we have to know not only the intensity of light, but also the delay or phase of the light wave. But there is no such device that can simultaneously store intensity and delay or phase. The concept of hologram is to record and regenerate the amplitude or intensity and phase simultaneously. Because the storing medium can store only intensity, they use interference, which means that Here's object wave, and here's another wave called the reference wave. Then at every point, the intensity uh, depends on the constructive interference of the two light waves or destructive interference of the two light waves. So at every point, actually what we store is the intensity, but the intensity at every point is uh, the contains the information of the phase compared with the phase of the reference wave at that point. So after storing this kind of information, the stored pattern is called the hologram. And we illuminate the same 
reference wave here. Then uh, the stored information modulates the optical wave front. There are two ways. One is to a, modulate the amplitude of light or transmittance of the light. And the other way is to modulate the phase of the light wave at every point, depending on the uh, stored information. Then amazingly, the diffracted light wave regenerates the original object wave. So this wavefront is the same as the wavefront here that passes through this medium. So if we observe this wave from this side, actually uh, we cannot distinguish this situation from this situation. So we can see that the real object is located here and the wave is coming out from the real object. That is the basic concept of the holography. And please note that here the, this part is called the hologram and the regenerated image is uh, the regeneration of a hologram. In actual situation, uh, usually we need laser light, which is a coherent light. Coherent means that light wave has a sinusoidal form and the sinusoidal wave is coming out continuously for a long time. Then it is split by beam splitter. A part of the light is reflected and then reflected go, and then go to, goes to the photographic plate. The other part is coming into the ob object and it is uh, reflected or diffracted and goes to the photographic plate. So here, the interference pattern between the reference wave and object wave forms the intensity pattern here, which is stored. So for the stored pattern, now if the reference beam is coming in and uh, it is deflected by the stored pattern and regenerates the original object imaging. So if we observe the image from here, actually we feel that a virtual object is located here and light wave is coming out from the virtual object. There are many applications of holography, such as 3D display and optical tweezers and holographic data storage and security applications and holographic optical elements and digital holographic microscope, which regenerates 3D images of small bio samples. Let me explain this interesting device, which is called HOE or holographic optical element. If general people is heard about holography, they think about 3D images, but as I explained earlier, the, the original concept of holography is not just to store and regenerate 3D images. Actually, the concept of holography is to regenerate the original waves or waves that we want. Here is an example. And here is the HOE, uh, the, the photopolymer material on the substrate. Uh, and then light waves are coming in. One is reference wave, the other one is signal wave. And signal wave has some this kind of a wave front. And the interference pattern between lay, uh, reference beam and signal beam is stored. This is a photopolymer and the, uh, inside the material uh, there are mon monomer molecules and at the in reasons where the intensity of interference pattern is high, the monomers are combined to generate uh, polymers. And then uh, the polymer parts become to have a higher reflective index for the light wave. 
and these um, monomer uh, la layers have a lower reflective index. So this kind of reflective index pattern is stored so after UV curing, uh, this uh, hologram is fixed. Now, if we illuminate light from this direction, uh, probe beam direction, uh, it is diffracted by this uh, volume grating or HV, and the original signal beam or object beam is regenerated in this direction. And we can see that this wavefront is the same as this original wavefront. So this is very funny and interesting device. Light is coming in, it is reflected or diffracted, and the, usually the reflection direction is in this way. But here, the reflection is in this funny direction. And more than that, the reflected light wavefront is the same as the originally uh, intended. Here is an example of experimental results in my lab. And here's a kind of a uh, glass material. And on top of the glass, uh, the, we coated it with photopolymer and we wrote two HOE patterns. And we are illuminating the glass with two projectors and one uh, generates 2D images on the uh, photopolymer, HOE, and another one generates 3D images. Actually, this is the image projected by the projector, but uh, after being diffracted by HOE, it can generate uh, 3D images like this. And uh, the house model is a real object behind the glass medium. So, this is a kind of see-through device or augmented reality device and the outside object can be seen through the window and both 2D and 3D images can be projected on the a, a glass medium. Here is an interesting application. And here is a, 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 a head-up display for car. And you probably know about the uh, head-up display. Many cars uh, have this kind of a head-up display. And they give information about the uh, speed of the car and directional information uh, and navigation information and so on. Generally speaking, the projector module is located here and it uh, gives light into the window. At the windshield of the car, it is reflected and uh, goes to the eye of the driver. But uh, because for the general window, the instance angle and reflection angle should be the same. So, the location of the projector module is very uh, limited and it is very hard to uh, adjust it. But if we use holographic optical element, as I explained earlier, then actually it means that the instance angle and reflection angle can be different. So in that way, uh, they implemented this. This was implemented by a company called the Weiwei in cooperation with the Hyundai Motor Company. And this is the uh, HUD implemented with HOE. So this is also one good example of the use of holography uh, for augmented reality or see-through imaging. Now let me talk about AR and VR. AR means augmented reality and VR means virtual reality. For the augmented reality, the, some information uh, from the projector is combined with real scene to give some aids like this. For virtual reality, 
actually all images are generated by computer and uh, they are mixed like this. There are many, many applications for AR and VR, especially in these days, uh, we are talking about metaverse. Meta means beyond, and verse comes from universe. So metaverse means we are living in a virtual world uh, generated by uh, the, the computer, and we are uh, inside the uh, virtual environment and we are interacting with uh, uh, using our avatars with other avatars and so on. So for that kind of uh, metaverse applications, actually uh, VR, virtual reality and AR are finally very important to provide a very immersive feeling. Now here is the basic structure of AR headset. Of course, there are AR devices uh, that do not need headset. We already saw some examples such as head-up displays in cars and window displays using holographic optical element. But also many companies are very much interested in the headset form of the AR and VR devices. For that purpose, here is the optical combiner and outside beam is coming in to our eye and here is a display engine and virtual image is uh, provided to the display engine and it uh, gives the uh, image and here is the lens and uh, the image is overlapped on top of the outside view. So, generally speaking, it is quite difficult to design this uh, AR headset in such a way uh, the system has good performance properties such as wide field of view, large eye box, and so on. Another interesting device is VR headset. As I explained earlier, for AR devices, we have to combine outside view and projector imaging. But for VR, we are not using any outside imaging. So we are using uh, this headset and here are two display panels for right eye and left eye. And there are two lenses uh, which enables wide view. And actually, using these uh, two lenses, the images on the two display panels are floating here and here with magnification. Generally speaking, uh, these images on the display panels are too close to the eye and we cannot observe these images directly. But if we use this kind of uh, wide viewing lenses and then the images are floating here with magnification. So this is a right eye image and left eye image uh, which are a little bit different to generate 3D feeling on the overlapped uh, region. Generally speaking, uh, this spacing cannot be reduced much because uh, by mathematical formula actually to float the image at some distance, uh, the separation between lens and uh, the display panel should be fixed and generally speaking, the distance is uh, several centimeters. But recently, including my group, um, there have been ideas to reduce the thickness of these VR devices. In our lab, uh, the thickness is reduced to about 8 0.8 millimeters. Anyway, these are some typical AR devices, commercialized AR devices. The most well-known device is Microsoft's HoloLens 2, and this is the panel resolution. And there are two panels, uh, right and left eyes. And field of view is generally uh, speaking uh, small compared with VR devices. 
Of course, there are many, many sensors such as head tracking, eye tracking, depth tracking, accelerometer, gyroscope, and so on. These are some typical examples of VR headsets. Oculus Quest 2 is very famous. Actually, uh, Oculus was uh, uh, made by a very young uh, young man uh, who was about 17 years old at the time and then actually uh, the company was merged to facebook uh, and it became to the facebook reality labs and recently facebook announced that it will change its name to meta which means uh, metaverse is, is becoming important but anyway uh, these are the resolutions and Generally speaking, the field of view for VR devices is large because they block the outside light and they are using this kind of wide-angle lenses. There are several issues on the VR AR devices and one of the important issues is the mismatch between virgin's distance and accommodation distance. This is the meaning of it. So uh, right eye and left eye are uh, expected to see different images. You can think about the 3D glasses in 3D theaters. Or if you wear VR devices, as I explained earlier, uh, that right eye and left eye observe different floating image planes. So in the case, the two eyes try to see clear images, which means that uh, the two eyes are actually looking at this, this distance, which is called accommodation distance. In fact, the eye lens thickness is adjusted in such a way that the two images are focused on the retina. But they're uh, converging or, or the converging angle is given uh, uh, matched to this uh, position which is called the divergence distance or convergence distance. In real situations, the two distances, accommodation distance and divergence distance are the same because uh, only there is a single real object here. But in this case of stereo images, the two distances are different which causes uh, visual fatigue. There are many, many researches to improve AR and VR devices, and holography can participate in AR VR displays. For example, the holography can generate 3D images rather than 2D images. So in that sense, uh, the Virgin's accommodation conflict can be minimized. And vision correction can be done uh, with the optical combiner uh, using holographic optical elements. And also, the optical lens can be made thin using a holographic optical element. And here's an example of a waveguide. An image is projected using specialized modulator, this is a display devices, and it is reflected and guided, and here is a funny device called HOE, and uh, this one diffracts light into the eye. So uh, if uh, eye is located here, the image is seen to the eye. And interestingly, uh, this HOE device can diffract in several directions as well. So if eye is moving, actually the uh, eye box can be, uh, can be uh, there are several eye boxes and the overall eye box size is expanded. There are lots of uh, holographic researches. I will just uh, show you a few uh, examples of the holographic images. And this is an example of a holographic display uh, to support continuous focus cues to avoid the uh, virgin accommodation conflict. And this is our group's work. And uh, it is uh, 
very time consuming to generate holographic images with computer. So uh, we are using deep learning based hologram generation technique to reduce the hologram generation time. Here, the hologram can be made either with real pickup image or with computer. For the computer generated hologram, this kind of deep learning technology is very important. And here are some examples of the use of deep learning based hologram generation method in several institutes in US. And here is a, a wide viewing angle holography uh, in, which was implemented in our lab. And you, know, you can see that with several laser diode arrays, we try to enlarge the viewing angle of the holograms. For the computer generated holograms, uh, actually, there are two kinds of holograms. One is to pick up real images with using uh, lasers. The other is to generate holograms using computer calculation. Because uh, we can imagine that there are two objects like this, and using computer, we can generate the uh, information of the, the uh, hologram, and it can be reconstructed. And so this is an example of the uh, computer-generated holograms and shown at different depths. So actually, it requires much, much computing time because uh, these kind of two hands are divided into small uh, triangular meshes. And for each triangular mesh, uh, we calculate the, uh, the optical field to generate that kind of uh, triangular meshes. So it requires much uh, calculation time. And here is uh, another example of the AR device using uh, HOE, holographic optical element. Here, image is projected from this side, and the image is diffracted by the HOE and converges to I. So the, this kind of uh, images are generated and these are of course outside views and these images are projected by the uh, projector here. Now uh, let me conclude my talk. A mature AR VR device cannot be built without good hardware and software support and uh, there are many many issues in uh, implementing good AR VR devices and uh, holography is a very important uh, direction uh, for that, especially to reduce uh, the versions accommodation conflict, uh, to show the, the real 3D images, and uh, so on. And many giant companies have uh, already invested in this uh, area of research. The evolution is uh, uh, continuing. Once Dennis Garber wrote like this, the future cannot be predicted, but futures can be invented. This wording has been uh, adopted and modified by uh, some other people later, for example, by Alan Kay, who was a computer scientist and so on. Anyway, the future cannot be predicted, but futures can be invented. Another similar saying is that the future belongs to younger generation like you. So I hope you enjoyed my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. The second presenter in the scientific section of the program is Professor Pa Kopwa, one of the top academic experts of holography in Hungary. He is an academic doctor of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. He has worked in the fields of optical information technologies, holography, three-dimensional image display, and optical measurement technology, which were also important milestones in the pioneering work of Dennis Gabor. In addition to research, he is focusing on the application and industrial utilization of the scientific results, 
which is also characterized by a numerous domestic and foreign industrial collaboration and his 23 patents. Professor Popa is the head of Atomic Physics Department at the Budapest University of Technology and Economics. Let's follow Professor Popa's presentation. Dear colleagues, uh, my name is Paul Koppa and I represent the uh, Technical University of Budapest Physical Institute. I am a professor at the Atomic Physics Department. The title of my talk is Holography in the Age of Information. And what I will be talking about is instead of the life of uh, Gabor Dénes, I will talk about the research which has been inspired by Gabor Dénes uh, at the Technical University in the field of physics at two different departments. On the title slide, I have written the name of uh, Denis Gabor in the original Hungarian uh, writing, as well as my name, because I know that Korean and Hungarian language is common in, in that we are uh, putting the last name first and the first name last. So to start with, I will speak a little bit about classical holography. Then I will switch to 3D uh, holograms and moving holograms, that is 3D moving images. Uh, then I will speak briefly about holographic data storage and holographic data security to be finished with the uh, today's uh, most uh, recent research on quantum information uh, science. I am certain that uh, for this audience, I don't need to introduce the principle of holography, but uh, as, as I found the original illustrations by uh, Dennis Gabor in, in his uh, 1948 uh, Nature paper, uh, I can illustrate the principle of holography uh, by his first uh, holograms taken. So obviously, the recording of the hologram starts by creating an interference between a signal wave and a reference wave. And a holographic material which is able to record these interference fringes. The interference fringes are visible in this image. And when you are reconstructing the hologram, you shine it with the, with the reference beam and you can see the uh, image, the object uh, appearing. This type of classical holography has become a kind of artistic uh, discipline right now. Many artists in Hungary and all over the world practice it to produce uh, 3D images uh, with single color or bright multicolor uh, 3D uh, objects. Even in, at the university, at the physics department, we are dealing with classical holography uh, first as an artistic hologram and also apply to technical uh, measurement technology. Uh, holographic interferometry is a very precise and very straightforward way of measuring shape, vibration and uh, the alteration of, of uh, object under load. So my colleague Jolt Pop is uh, just showing you the recording of a hologram in his lab which is in fact a student's lab where students at the university can take uh, holograms as a laboratory practice. A very popular uh, development of holography would be to extend the static three-dimensional images to moving holograms, that is making moving 3D images. Unfortunately, the real moving hologram presents uh, technical challenges which are uh, extreme uh, both in terms of, of display hardware and in terms of data processing. So all the research which goes directly to, to dynamical holography is in, in a very initial state right now. What we are doing instead is called 3D displays and uh, many people are all around the world uh, are dealing with the development of different 3D display principles of which the most uh, initial ones are all already on the market, 
which are, I would say, mostly stereoscopic images, which means that you only have two views for the two eyes. And these views are static, doesn't change with your position. You cannot look into object, you cannot look under the table, and the view is not changing by your position. Obviously, this is very far from being a moving hologram, uh, but the newest developments deal with uh, better and better 3D technologies. So the, the ultimate goal would be to have uh, something which is containing a full parallax, which means that if you go closer to the image, you look it from closer. If you look from right, you see it from the right. You can look under the table and so on. We also have a project which uh, has a goal to fulfill this. And uh, for this project, I will show you a few images of our head-mounted three-dimensional uh, storage device, which is still not holographic, but it's approaching or it's, it's trying to, to show as you look at a holographic uh, image. The applications of, of these 3D displays extend from the medical imaging, where you can image as a virtual reality image uh, the 3D X-ray uh, to the body of the patient uh, itself. Technical imaging where you can put uh, images uh, during a manufacturing line uh, for helping the workers to, to put together pieces. Or security images like when, when you have in your car images that show you uh, the dangers of the different uh, traffic situations. So our 3D head-mounted uh, display is composed of a head-mounted unit that you put uh, as a helmet for the moment, but obviously uh, the plan is to miniaturize it as uh, integrated in a glass or something like that. Uh, and a special display, which is a retro-reflective screen, it's a completely passive device, which reflects, reflects the light back to the viewer's eye, uh, the, much the same way as traffic signs do it, it uh, on the roadside. We have built a demonstrator of this uh, principle, which is uh, working quite nicely. And we, we have integrated a screen tracking camera uh, between the two uh, projectors on, on the helmet, which is uh, always determining the viewing position with respect to the screen and giving you uh, feedback uh, what uh, images to, to put out for the right and the left eye. Recent development of this project uh, is uh, 3D and can be also 2D head-up displays which are uh, applied in vehicles, typically cars or air airplanes, uh, to project images on the windscreen and uh, to make a kind of virtual reality in which the driver don't have to look down and refocus uh, the site during writing. And obviously later on then, when uh, these vehicles will be autonomous, uh, then this could be used as a kind of entertainment display, watching uh, 2D or 3D movies, or checking emails or browsing on the internet on the windscreen. And uh, obviously head-up displays do exist in uh, today's mainly luxury car models, but these are very limited in, in image size. So the typical viewing angle is about 9 to 12 degrees horizontally. And our goal is to make a system which is considerably extending this uh, viewing angle up to 40 or maybe 50 degrees which is basically almost the whole windscreen will be covered by, by the image of this uh, head-up display. Uh, we have uh, had a certain number of problems to solve, and we believe that we, we are uh, able to solve it uh, one by one. And in the lab, we have built a first demonstrator, which is uh, uh, shown in this, uh, this image. And we have also uh, made a little uh, film in our lab to show you uh, the development of the second demonstrator, which is, which is on the way right now. Here you can see a 
uh, an original uh, car windscreen, you can uh, see a flat panel based uh, display and uh, some planar optics which deals with the polarization and the uh, focusing of the, of the light in a planar optical manner. Uh, when speaking about moving holograms, I mentioned that uh, the data quantity uh, stored in a hologram is huge. So we can make use of this huge quantity of data for using holography as a data storage uh, device. And that has been proposed by a Dutch researcher uh, in the 60s, Van Herden, to, to use holography for data storage. The, the principle of hol holographic data storage is quite similar to holography, but instead of an object beam, you are using a data page composed of uh, different bright and black uh, dots. And the recording is uh, quite straightforward. And we have been lucky between 2004 and 2009, eight, uh, to, to take part in holographic data storage development together with different European uh, industrial partners and academic partners in one project, which was called ATOS project, uh, which was page organized uh, holographic data storage project, which ended with a nice demonstrator shown here in this slide. And another project which has had a different approach, a micro holographic approach proposed by the Technical University of Berlin, where we have recorded micro holograms, tiny one bit uh, holograms in multiple layers. And both of these approaches uh, demonstrated very high data storage density, which is approaching the one terabyte per disk uh, uh, data quantity, which is, which is really huge. Uh, quantity of, of data. Unfortunately, this, uh, this technology has not been uh, commercialized yet uh, because of its complexity and also because of the, the widespread of the internet that you don't need a real huge capacity storage at home, uh, but it's still a viable technology. Another very important aspect of holography is that you cannot reconstruct a hologram with a reference beam which is not exactly matching uh, the reference beam that has been used for recording. Uh, this feature can be uh, used for security holography. Security holography is also applied on bank cards and uh, traffic uh, tickets as, as static holograms, but obviously this could be further developed for uh, containing some kind of security information and forbidding the copying or, or the access, illegal access to this information. So our, our project in the beginning of the years 2000 until 2003 maybe was to produce a holographic data storage device for security application without the huge uh, information density, which we uh, aimed in the first project I mentioned, but having extreme security. And uh, extreme security uh, has proven to be produced seeing quite short equivalent key lengths, if you are speaking in terms of encryption, classical digital encryption key length, if using intensity images, but we realized that instead of intensity images, we are using phase coded, phase modulated images, then the key length can be extremely long. It can go up to 100,000 bits, which is uh, 100 times as much as the, as the recent uh, digital encryption key lengths. And uh, the whole encryption and decryption process can be done in milliseconds in one uh, clock cycle due to very fast optical processing. So this is a kind of proposal which, is, which has been very well known uh, at that time and which is uh, producing an almost uncrackable uh, encryption possibility, a little bit equivalent to the 
very famous one-time pad that information scientists use for, for very, very secure data encryption. Uh, the important thing in one-time pad and also its optical equivalent is that uh, the encryption key should be used only once, which means that your encryption key length should be as long as your uh, text or your data to be encrypted because you cannot reuse this key and with this way mathematicians prove that in this in this way uh, there is no way to crack uh, the encryption that presents a huge problem because the key management will become very difficult if you have to send a message of one uh, megabyte of information to someone uh, encrypted with this technique, then you have uh, to have a key which is also one megabyte long, which is seems to be almost impossible because obviously uh, you cannot exchange the keys through the internet because anyone can uh, can uh, eavesdrop on the line and can have your keys and dec decrypt your your messages. So the solution for this uh, problem is the so-called quantum internet that you can read a lot about, uh, we, in which we will use, because it's uh, under development uh, right now, we will use a single photon uh, emission to distribute these keys to, the, to both parties uh, who, who take part in the encrypted data uh, transmission. Uh, the central part of this, uh, this data transmission uh, process is a source which emits pairs of single photons, which are, that's what physicists say, entangled, which means that in many properties, these pairs of photons are uh, like a twins for humans. Many properties of the photons are either alike or opposite with the other, but we can uh, say it in advance whether these properties, if we know what the state of one photon, for example, the polarization state of one photon, that the other photon will have the same polarization for one type of, uh, of uh, entangled photon pair source. And the central element of all this infrastructure, or one of the most important uh, components of this infrastructure, is the source itself, which emits these photons. So in the recent years, a few years ago, uh, we, we have started to put together a lab which deals with this uh, quantum uh, internet components and which develops robust and uh, small entangled uh, photon pair sources. You can see this new lab which has been started in 2018, that is three years ago, and now already producing the first uh, very bright and very reliable uh, entangled photon sources, uh, which will be hopefully used by our uh, electrical engineer and in information scientist colleagues to realize a secure quantum internet. So that's where I would like to finish. Thank you for your attention and I also uh, thank very much the team which as I told you is composed of two uh, departments at the Physical Institute here at the Technical University and the key uh, participants are shown in this last slide. Thank you again and if you have any questions please don't hesitate to ask me. Thank you very much for your attention. Mi a közös a bérplazma terápiában, a kisbárány klónozásban, fényáteresztő betonban, a hidrogén előállító masinában és a jól ismert Rubik kockában, vagy mindegyik Gábor Dénes díjat ért magyar feltalálójának. Márpedig műszaki alkotókban mi magyarok igencsak bővelkedünk. 
Így aztán nem is csoda, hogy 1989 óta minden évben egyre több határainkon belül és azokon túlalkotó magyar tudós kapja meg tudományos és innovációs munkájáért a Gábor Dénes díjat. A díjazott a klubja pedig igencsak sok taggal büszkélkedhet. Mára több mint 200-an vannak. Ők viszik tovább azt a fajta mindig tenni vágyó attitűdöt, ami a 120 éve született Gábor Dénest is hajtotta, amikor megalkotta az 1971-ben Nobel-díjat érő holográfia elvét. So the legacy of Gábor Dénes lives on with the award named after him. With that, the Let's Invent the Future Together event comes to an end. Thank you for watching. We thank the presenters and the collaborating staff members of the Gábor Dénes Foundation, the Liszt Institute Hungarian Cultural Center Seoul and the Embassy of Hungary in Seoul for their contributions and support. All the best and goodbye.